um, obviously, first of all, welcome uh, everybody to this, the, the third uh, Clans of Ireland online members forum. Uh, today, some of us uh, obviously are coming uh, from the chapter house of Christchurch uh, Cathedral in Dublin, where the attendees at this year's cultural summit were guests of the Dean as we unveiled the historical sites plaque. Unfortunately, I am uh, unable to be with you this morning. I would love to have been. Um, our forum is in two parts today, beginning with two addresses, followed by uh, discussions, associated discussions. Uh, Luke McInerney will facilitate uh, both of these discussions. Dr. Russell O'Regan of Queen's University Belfast and formerly of UCD and UCC will discuss the Irish genealogical tradition with Luke. And Robert O'Halloran, our newly elected company secretary, will discuss the formation and development of his new O'Halloran clan organization. Following this, the forum will revert to the previous open forum pattern when we will discuss the new website and the annual cultural summit for 2024. So that that's it. Before I run out of breath, I would now like to hand over to you, Luke. Thank you, Gorod. Ta fotio roi of Galer. So welcome, everyone. My name is Luke McInerney, and I'm the last Kuhalak, or the vice chairman of the Fincher Neheran, the clans of Ireland. Today we have an excellent lineup of speakers who will speak on a range of diverse topics, uh, including the Gaelic medieval um, genealogical tradition and also how to begin research on an Irish clan. We are delivering these lectures from the chapter house here at the renowned Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin city centre, and we are pleased to be able to augment our activities as a board by delivering high quality cultural and academic talks which we hope are of interest to our members and which also help forward the study of medieval Gaelic Ireland. Our first guest today is Dr. Russell O'Riagon, who will deliver an academic talk about the medieval Gaelic genealogies. Our second speaker is a Clans of Ireland board member, Mr. Robbo Halloran, who will provide his own personal insight into clan and family historical research. As you know, at our cultural summit held last month, we had an excellent array of lecturers and lectures on medieval and early modern Ireland. So today is an extension of those talks and a continuation of bringing to the public a series of educational lectures. So we thank you for joining us and for your attention. Turning now to our first lecture, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Russell O'Riagon. So welcome, Russell. A graduate of the University of Cambridge, UCD, and the University of Galway, Dr. O'Riagon is currently an Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellow at the University College Dublin, where he's exploring the long-term impact of Viking Age of the Viking Age on Scandinavia. Prior to that, he was involved in Mapping Lineages project at Queen's University Belfast after four years stint at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Over the years, he has moved between archaeology, history, sociology, geography, English, transcultural and post colonial studies, I believe, attempting to tie together spatial and material cultural approaches to the study of the past. And so his talk today will draw on some of this material and also some some other um, material which he's currently researching. So hopefully, which hopefully we'll see in a, a number of publications uh, for this year and next. We're very much privileged to have Dr. Oriagon talk to us about the medieval Gaelic genealogical tradition. So without any further ado, I shall hand you over to Russell. Should we swap yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so um, for the medieval genealogies that I'm going to talk about today, I'm mainly going to be speaking about um, uh, genealogies found in a range of manuscripts dating to between the 12th and the 18th centuries. Um, of these, there's about 25 significant collections, um, but along with that, then we've got maybe another 50 with quite a bit of material and um, maybe about 350 or even 400 uh, manuscripts that have some often unique genealogical material from across this period. Um, so selections from a tiny proportion of these uh, have been published, I'd say about 20, maybe 21 publications, 
Um, and then only about maybe two have been published in total and even few have, uh, fewer have been translated. So um, yeah, on the right, you can see what one of these genealogies looks like. It's the genealogy of, um, well, of several groups, um, an element of the Ulla genealogies along with the Kings of Alba and uh, the Dacia uh, genealogical material all found in the Book of Leinster. We'll be returning to this exact page um, later on in the lecture. So our uh, roadmap for today. Um, so first I'll talk about um, some tips maybe for navigating manuscripts and their editions. Then I will give an introduction to the main groups of genealogical collections. Um, then I will talk a bit about the uses to which they can be put, which I would hope would be of interest um, in particular to uh, the, the members of, of, of the clans group. Um, then I will talk a bit about the origin and evolution of surnames um, uh, from group and lineage names, um, which might help you in some instances trace your uh, current surname back to the 7th or 8th century in some instances, but that's going to come with a lot of caveats, I have to say. Um, then we're going to talk again about using the genealogical collections um, on a kind of more general level, um, and I'm going to show you how I've used them uh, using uh, or, or through a few case studies. So I plan on doing three case studies and then, yeah, finita men, uh, which is a phrase you find again and again and again in these collections. So um, before I go further, um, some useful publications. Uh, I have given uh, Luke a reading list that can be forwarded to all the members. And um, if anyone has got any questions, you can find me uh, very easily on the U University College Dublin website. Um, but these, I think, are the, are the highlights. So on the left hand side, um, those three are still in print. Um, they can sometimes seem like they're very hard to find online, but they are permanently available from the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies web shop. Um, at a normal price. So you see some of these go for 300 on eBay and then you look up the Dias website and they're 30 or 40 euro. So I would strongly recommend familiarizing yourself with that website in general if um, if you plan on going further with genealogical research. Um, on the right hand side, um, some other uh, public, published material that I found very useful, um, each with their own problems, but those, those Dobbs, those three Dobbs pieces, she at least provides in two instances a uh, translation. So that can be very, very helpful when you're um, getting to grips with this material. So navigating. Sorry, sorry Russell, uh, we've just yeah. lost the, uh, the, uh, the shared screen. OK. Is it still gone? It's gone. gone. All right, we'll have to reshare there. And then this one, yeah. Teams. <clears throat> Some work. To... Yeah, we're back up, but are we back on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to start from. If I go in here, you see, I can. Um, I can start from the current slide. You know. Yeah. Okay. How's that? Are we back? Yes, we are. Yeah, all good. Okay. Yes, back, back for oh. me. All right. Um, I've deliberately left some of the screen blank for the moment because this is a little bit of a complex slide. So um, this here is a little bit of a guide as to how to uh, navigate and deal with um, this manuscript material and the edited versions of it. I really wish that I had been given a slide like this myself 12 or 13 years ago, um, because sometimes if you haven't been given an introduction to this, it can be quite confusing. So first of all, um, some editors uh, and people who are um, in charge of the um, online versions, online scans of these manuscripts might use foliation, so counting folios. So a folio, folium is a leaf, so they will count both sides of the leaf as one in a number. Um, and then it will be divided up usually into recto on the right hand side, verso the left hand side or back side of the leaf. Um, so you will use F for one, a single folium, then you will use FF for a range of folia. Um, columns are often indicated by a letter um, after this so that you can navigate around the page because you think back to the um, the page from the Book of Leinster that I, that I used on the second slide, there's multiple, um, what, seven columns there, eight columns sometimes in some of them. Um, but also um, line numbers can be useful, but I would also say that um, some editors or codicologists might um, <laughs> Count things a little bit differently, so sometimes it's good to um, to just double check um, against different editions to, to navigate between these things or just check the actual manuscript. 
So then um, some other editors and codicologists use pagination. Um, so that would be counting the faces on each side of the leaf. So P for single, PP for a range of pages, again with the columns indicated by letter. Now that's very, very abstract, I know. So here's an example. So the Genelach Desh um, in, the, in Rawlinson B502, um, some people will count that as on page 143, column B uh, from line 15, or on folium 78, recto B, line 15. So depending on your edition, they will use each one of those, but I will say that the online scans, higher resolution scans of B502 on the Bodleian website, they use fo the folio number. So um, good to keep that in mind. Um, I will say that some people use a bit of variation when they're counting pages as opposed to folia. So again, that can be a little bit confusing, but if you go back to the manuscript, you will you will get there. Um, but I have a little formula here for those of you using B502. If you add 13 to the page number, divide it by two. And if you get a whole number result, it's uh, recto. If you get a half number in the result, it's verso. So that formula has saved my life many, many, many times when I'm trying to check something in a manuscript against the published edition. So genealogies. Are, are the genealogies or are they much more? Um, I would divide um, the material that we're going to be talking about today into, into three categories. Um, I would say genealogies proper, which are working back from a uh, named figure. So uh, Russell, Mark Owen, Mark Owen, um, Mark Matthew, Mark Seamus, Mark Seamus, Mark Matthew is my own genealogy going back into the 19th century. Um, Oriavan at the end of it, of course. Um, then I what I would call menu goods, so that's uh, mid layers for statement. Uh, so a statement of the genealogy of X group, or just sometimes it will have Shanachus plus X. Um, so just the heritage of whoever. So that's working forward in time, usually from a shared ancestor. So it might start with a famous figure um, with someone like, well, Nini Gwilak, for example, when they're outlining the um, the Enel narrative dynastic complex, I would call it, and they will give then the seven sons of Neil or nine sons or 12 sons, depending on what you're, which one you're reading, and then work through all of the groups that are uh, descended from them. And then you have King List, which is just a statement of the holders of a particular position. So for example, Re Ullud, the kings of the Ullud, sometimes that can be a, a, an actual member of the Ullud, sometimes it can be a reference to an over kingdom. So, these work forward in time usually, and all the figures are not necessarily related. So you often find those at the very start of a group of genealogies, and then they go into the other two. Now, Donoko Koran, um, the late and lamented Donoko Koran, in his fantastic 2017 piece on the genealogies in, in the first chapter of the Royal Irish Academy book on the Book of Ballymote, um, has four main methods of compilation. He would say you have a single line of ascent with a prose track attached to it, that, uh, listing collateral lineages that you can check over and back, or you could have descent texts over several generations outlining multiple lineages with references to key figures, wives, etc. Often these are called Parisia or Minugud, min, Minugud Hanukkah's X. Um, then you would have a full single lineage accompanied by shorter genealogies uh, that don't go all the way back. You get those quite commonly. We, we'll see a couple of those in a while when we're talking about the Dacia. And uh, then you have a list of convergences between lineages. Um, so it might be where they branch out. Um, so that's a good way for this. This maybe to me indicates as well that these were often used for teaching purposes as much as for um, propaganda or any other uh, explanation you might have. So some uh, selected uh, secular collections. So I would group these into five. So the first is the old Irish material that's embedded usually actually in early modern um, manuscripts. So the most famous is Balyachun Ked Katig. That's been edited by Adele Bratnock um, in the fantastic 2005 book on the, on the Kingship of Tara. Uh, we won't be talking about these today. Group two is the 12th century manuscripts. Group three, late medieval manuscripts. So by late medieval, I mean um, 13th, 14th, 15th century. And then group four is early modern manuscripts, which um, Luke would be much more familiar with than me. So I'm, I'm actually quite terrified to even talk about them in case I'm going to be wrong. And um, group five are small bits of um, genealogical material embedded in a range of other um, media. We might talk a little bit about those. Um, I've done a lot of research on those over the years. Um, but yeah, we'll, the main focus will be on group two and three. So group two, I call it group 2A, Rawlinson B502, found in, um, in, in Oxford in the Bodleian Library, compiled about 1125 to 1150. Some people might say 1130, but Let's not be too precise, maybe. 
So what this is, is a collection of learned texts uh, ranging from biblical history and commentary to geography, to um, poems, prose materials on dynasties, ecclesiastical material and secular genealogies and kinglists. So it's, it's quite the um, collection. And, and this is what all of these manuscripts nearly we're going to be speaking about are variations on this theme. But B502 isn't quite there yet. I think the Book of Leinster, as we'll talk about in a minute, is a much more perfect example of this kind of collection of material that hyper educated people were supposed to either know or be familiar with. So um, in terms of the genealogical collection in there, um, starts with some verse king lists, then goes into the Ligon and the Ostriga, and then it stops, shifts to a text about the kings of Ireland that was taken from the Minigod version of Levergvala Aaron, which is uh, the kind of like a fourth recension, but actually it's the earliest version of, of the Book of Invasions. And then um, this uh, text, the Levergvala Aaron or the Book of Invasions, is used to structure more or less the rest of the material in there. And, and this is a common theme um, that we we'll find throughout all the other manuscripts. So yeah, um, first you start with Shil Kund, so the descendants of Khan, so the Kanukta and the Enil and the Argila, um, but um, some of the Dacia groups, then it moves on to the uh, descendants of Ever, uh, so going all the way back to the, one of the two sons of uh, Mil Espana, um, so that would cover most of the Munster groups, um, mainly the Oganachta. Um, then you would have the Shanaka Shil Eir, um, which are descendants of Eir, so the other brother, and uh, that is basically the Aaron, um, which of course gives us our name, the Iverni, as they were in the late Iron Age. Um, so you have the Kyrga and various minor groups, in, or what were later minor groups, at least in, in, in Muava or Munster, but also the Ullud, the Critton, and the Dal Rieta, and the Fomorians. So that's worth keeping in mind as well, because we'll talk a little bit about that, that in a few minutes again. And then the whole thing is rounded out with a set of verse king lists. Then 2B, I call it 2A and 2B because they're not exactly the same. Um, there's more stuff in the Book of Leinster. So um, this was compiled in the later uh, 12th century, um, possibly as late as 1170, I would imagine. But that might be just thinking in terms of the Anglo-Norman invasion. Um, it's similar, but um, more expansive than the B502 collection. Again, it's a collection of all the learned texts, but actually with even more stuff in there. Um, it also has what are usually regarded as the number one uh, recension uh, um, for a lot of the sagas, for example. So the, the more elaborate version of Tom Cooling is found here with the less elaborate version in Lover Nahidra, which is about 70 years older. Um, and a lot of this stuff has been published separately, um, often with uh, translations, but then the whole manuscript has been given a fantastic edition by uh, the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies in six volumes. And if you are going to buy a book, I would recommend getting the final volume edited by Anna Sullivan, which has the genealogies and also all of the ecclesiastical material. And it's a really, really well done um, edition, I have to say. And that edition is also available online on the Corpus of Electronic Texts um, at UCC. But I would still always favour the printed edition um, over the online one, just in terms of it makes it easier to reference. Um, and you can sit down and flick through it um, when you're trying to relax on a Saturday evening, you know. <laughs> At least that's what I know Luke does. But. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of layout, um, again, you start with the Ligon, moves on to Shiel Ever, so the descendants of Ever, then the descendants of Ear, then what can only be described as Misk, <laughs> then it moves on to some of the, the Southern Enail, then onto a range of groups that are supposed to be descended from the Aaron, um, so the Conila, Critton, or Critney. Ullad and the Kings of Alba, then it moves on to Muva again, um, but it has separate material, has separate material on the Ligon, has the Northern Inel, Argila, the Canucta and the Ostriga. So again, when you're comparing between the two, you're starting to already see there might be more than one official version of this material. And that's very, very important to keep in mind when we move on to Group 3. So I put the whole lot there together. Um, so Group uh, 3 is exemplified best by, I think, the Book of Lekin, um, also the Book of Ballymote. Um, less so uh, by the Book of Imania, just because we're missing uh, the opening folia, um, but there's a fantastic new book about the Book of Imania and a lot of very interesting openly available online lectures from the conference there through Royal Irish Academy. So I would send you there if you want to find out more about that manuscript. And then another related um, collection is in Loud 610 over in uh, Oxford. Uh, all of these, except for the first one there, TCD uh, MS 1298, that really badly needs an online scan, I, because this is probably slightly older than the rest of them and slightly more important and it has a lot of um, very, very unique uh, versions of text. So if anybody's ever looking to donate 
um, to an Irish institution, um, this would be a good thing to donate for. Um, so here I've got some um, uh, published material based on, on that. You can go to the reading list if you want to find out more. Um, all of these have been very influential, especially the John Bannerman, which shaped the study of, of the history of Northern Britain for 50 years. I'm currently trying to unshape it in that respect, but let's see. Um, so then group four, um, these are, I have to admit, these are ones that um, I do work with, but I haven't got the same level of knowledge as the as the high medieval ones and late medieval ones. So most famously, Lower Morn and Gelnach, that is found in all of the libraries in Ireland in an absolutely magisterial edition, um, which runs to 1,300,000 words or thereabouts in, in edition, including the index. You've got 30,500 individuals. It's just absolutely, it's a work of amazing scholarship to produce it in the first place in the 17th century and again to edit it. But another important one for those of you who are interested in the south of Ireland um, is on Laura uh, Mwinyach. Um, that's in two 18th century manuscripts. I've got them listed there in both Royal Irish Academy. Um, but it's probably a 17th century text uh, based in turn maybe on some uh, lost 10th, 11th, 12th century material. So if you're interested in how the Dáil Gosh imposed themselves on the whole of uh, Munster and displaced a lot of the pre-existing lineages and then rewrote the past to justify that, this is an amazing text for that. But if you're also researching surnames, I think this, uh, these two that I've just mentioned are the two you go to first because you can still connect a lot of later material to these groups because they run on into the late medieval period, which the other ones don't. So into the 15th, 16th, and even 17th centuries. And then of course, and I've got it misattributed to the wrong O'Cleary there, um, but my, my cat was climbing all over the keyboard. It was of course Ku Krija and not Michal who uh, put together this, but uh, I would also say that I don't think the four masters ever worked in isolation completely, but there you've got a mixture. They, they drew together a mixture of secular and ecclesiastic uh, genealogies in the 17th century. Um, and then, yeah, group five are just found in a lot of other types of texts. So in the annals, which are uh, events of the year under a year heading, not necessarily compiled in the year that they're describing, hagiographies, biographies of saints, calendars of saints feast days, um, narrative history is trying to draw everything together, which I would argue is sometimes what the genealogies are trying to do, some stuff in sagas and some material in the uh, 10th and 11th century synchronisms, where uh, these were used to, for people who were training to be a sea to be the person who was who was a, who could do Paritia, you often learned off these poems to had all of the important stuff. Um, and the ecclesiastic collections, I would say ignore these at your peril because they have material under that you don't find in any other collections where you might find families, both ecclesiastic and non-ecclesiastic, that are otherwise written out of the narrative. Um, I, again and again and again, um, I, I find something that really, really, really sheds light on it. And, and these have been extremely well edited so there's, what did I say, 11 um, surviving versions at least, and Pai Corrine has done an edition of all of them together, um, taking the um, the Book of Leinster uh, collection as the, the main basis and then providing all of the variants. So that's an absolute, that's also available from Dias. It's a really, really good book to have on your bookshelf. Um, I know, yeah, shameless plug, if I dare, I'm going to be speaking about this material later in the month on, um, at the Irish Conference of Medievalists, which should be open, I hope, to the public as well. So if any of you are around Dublin, um, I would love to see you there. Um, but look, I'm, I'm going to move on to more abstract stuff before I go on to the case studies. Um, can we identify phases of compilation? Um, strangely enough, the group three texts, which are supposed to be later, are more extensive than those in group two. Um, but I think this, and I'm not the only one who thinks this, um, I think everybody who, who deals with this material and who's the, especially with the Book of Leinster, when you look at um, the absolutely perfect version of Tombow Cooling and it's in there compared to the work in progress that's still found in Lever the Hydra, I think that um, these are being redacted probably in the 12th century or in a maybe a late 11th century exemplar that was used by both that are just fine tuning them down and trying to get a lot of the um, dissonance out of there. They don't manage that. There's a lot of stuff, internal contradictions in there that I hopefully will be building my career on. but. It does seem that um, rather bizarrely, slightly bizarrely maybe at least, the late medieval ones, especially in Lekin, do um, reflect an earlier exemplar, possibly um, in the um, maybe mid 11th century, if not even slightly earlier. Um, but then how does this explain so many genealogies that work back from 8th century figures, which you will find again and again and again in this text. And I think myself and Luke might talk about this um, in the chat as well later, because this is quite the issue. But in terms of modeling the transmission, 
Um, so uh, Owen McNeil put uh, put out this kind of schema where there's the Psalter of Cashel, which is mentioned in the Book of Lekin, in the Book of Ballymore as um, an exemplar text. This seems to be drawn together not by Cormac MacQuillanon in the early 10th century as, as a, um, a later tradition grew up around that. It's probably produced under the Dalgosh, either under Matkaman or under Breen Boruva or both of them, which is basically this is the new received wisdom. Um, and it has a lot of intersection with uh, Lower Bratnach, which has an alternative model uh, for uh, Irish history um, that gets replaced by Lower Gavala. So this is an interesting um, point in um, Irish intellectual history. Then there's a Northern redaction, probably at Armagh. Then at least one more Northern redaction. So one of these is probably the Book of Duvdaleha, which you find um, in the Annals of Ulster referenced as um, as an alternative a lot of the time to um, to one annual the analyst will then go, but I found this in the book of Dov Daleha, but it's been lost, unfortunately, but it seems to have been annals and genealogies. And um, then you have what, what might be called the Ligon um, genealogies, which are represented then by um, RB 502 in the book of Leinster. And then you have something amazing going on in Northwest Connacht, probably even as late as, as early as the 13th century, uh, where all of our group three texts are produced in the northwest of Connacht by, in, in, in secular schools, which is really, really, really something that would require a full lecture by itself to talk about. Um, but look, in terms of Gaelic scholarship, why are all these being put together? Um, in the 10th century, if you want to talk about the context of the Psalter of Cashel being put together, there is new origin myths, uh, new universal history, trying to tie in with um, Frankish texts, trying to tie in with um, currents uh, across Europe. You can compare, as I said, Lever Ratnock and Lever Govala Aaron. And um, yeah, the genealogical uh, material is very much part of this attempt at total history. And on the right hand side, I've given some other attempts at total history, the tripartite life of Patrick, for example. So it's our man, Clon McNoise, I think are particularly important in this. They're not the only sites that are doing it, but we have a lot of information that has survived from there. Um, but we can talk about that maybe again in the in the questions. Um, Again, relationship to other forms of evidence. I've kind of covered all of this, but um, not everybody who's mentioned the annals appears in the genealogies, and definitely not everybody in the genealogies is mentioned in the annals. And this applies to even kings. So sometimes there's still um, some selection going on. Um, I'd probably skip ahead actually to because I really wanted to uh, go into the case studies. So, yeah. Um, again, before I go, launch into the case studies, why so many 8th century items? I'm going to keep coming back to this. Um, is it a matter of an of a 8th century exemplar? It would seem that it is on first glance, but on, a, on second thought, then maybe is it a sign of downward social pressure where um, cadet lineages of the main lineages are displacing the pre-existing holders of territories? And then is this then being written about in the 11th, in the, sorry, in the 9th century and 10th century at a safe distance from the 8th century. So if you can go the black, the, the Critna, uh, Nelnia, for example, who were who produced two kings over kings of Ireland um, are written out. They vanished. They vanished from the annals in the 9th century. They vanished from the genealogies in the 8th century and the Equadalbad uh, lineage from um, from around Antrim town set themselves up then as being the Dal Narja and that all of the other ones are just sub subverted. They're just cadet branches due often from the second set of sons of their progenitor. Um, or is it a case of it's all of the above? I would say it's all of the above. And I would say this, it's, um, aporia is okay. It's okay not to be completely certain about this. As Socrates taught us, we can shrug our shoulders and we sometimes just have to do that. But if we just outline all of the different possibilities, I think that that in itself is often a very important research finding. Um, yeah, so in terms of case study, so naming groups and lineages before we launch into the more detailed material. So the uh, Riga or Riga, um, usually Riga, um, suffix that is related to stuff like Riki in Old Norse, Reich in German. It just it can mean kingdom, but not in the sense that we understand kingdom in our post early modern monarchy level. But it's it's a group, shall we say? And you get the Kotriga, so the food providing group, the Bonriga, probably the cow group, the Kiriga, the black group, our black kingdom, or you know. And uh, then we get Kirku or Korko, might be seed or genus related to Korka or oats. So you get the Korka Guina. For example, this is usually a lot older, um, but sometimes it's used interchangeably with Dal, which is share. So Dal Narda, the share of Arja, Dal Gas, share of Gas, Dal Rita, etc. So then Shiel, so you get to Shiel Fingen, uh, who you might have never heard of, but there were kings of 
of Critton, of the Critton in the north as well. Shilnead or Slynead, um, one of the southern Neenail groups. Then more familiar would be Kenel, Kind or Kindred. Um, but then you get maybe an individual person might be called Moku, um, which would be the descendant of uh, Recha, therefore Dark Hill Moku Recha, for example. Then you got E, which is from a shared ancestor. Ua might be from your just your grandfather, but becomes a surname over time. So you'll compare Donald Ua Neil to Flat Flatfortak Ua Neil. I use a capital letter just to uh, demonstrate that that's been used as a surname, and that's one of our oldest surnames actually. That you can definitely trace that to the 10th century, 100%. And uh, then you get to McLaughlin, who are also related. That becomes a surname over time. Um, I will just skip this, if that's all right. I, I, I just basically said most of this. Uh, just to yeah, keep in mind. The period 900, 1200 is crucial. Here you can see the evolution of one name. So you get the Aaron to the Ullad, Dolphitok, Dolphitok segments, the Canal Demon, uh, descended from Demon, um, son of Carol, uh, displace all of the other competition. Then they split into the Evlatmak and Canal uh, Nengasa, the Evlatmak eventually split, and the Ihekata, so Hahi, this, this, this is this still the same surname. Um, split and become the dominant group, and then that dominant group splits and becomes the Dun uh, uh, so Dun Levi. So, yeah, Ullad and Critton, um, as I just mentioned, the Canal Demon displace all of the competition, and the Equadalbad from um, the dark bit east of Loch Ney uh, managed to displace all of the other groups. So, when we look at some of the older material, we find stuff that contradicts this model. So I've got a video on YouTube talking about some of these groups that got subverted. So if you just put my name into YouTube, you'll find it. Um, it's about the lost kingdoms of the Northeast. And yes, possibly, but this is partially possibly due to having cadet branches in the church writing the text in places like Bangor and Armagh. So sometimes it might be a creation of the scriptorium rather than on the field, shall we say. Um, but one of the things I will say is the Yekok Kobo, so from southeast of Loch Ness, they managed to survive no matter what. They survived, they survived the Anglo Norman invasion. They're still knocking around. And of course, it's the Guinness family, um, you know, so they do quite well. They're, they're still a big family. Um, so, yeah, this is just an over, overview of all the kings of the Olid, um, mainly from the Dolphitok. That's all I want you to focus on there uh, rather than go all the way through the paper. Um, yeah, so there are thousands of pieces of data um, in the Ullad genealogies. I'm not going to outline all of them now, but if you are interested in the Ullad, if you come from the Northeast yourself or your family come from the Northeast, there is some fascinating material in there. Um, but one thing I will draw to is that the last one, maybe Luke, this is one for you, um, is the evidence for ecclesiastic lineages that pops up, uh, the Idiochon, the uh, Alila of Saul, um, who are still knocking around in the 12th and 13th century. Um, and you get the Elegra of, uh, of Don Patrick, for example, who I never find anywhere else. Um, but you will find them when you go through uh, this material. You don't even find these in the ecclesiastical genealogies, just in these statements. Um, other stuff you might find is the Ibdig the, from the Hebrides, bizarrely, group who are the competing for the overkingship of Ullad with the Canel Demon. And the Eacock Arja are, uh, are allied against them, and there's a fosterage relationship. Then you get the Shield Fingen, who I, you never would even hear of, but they produced two kings um, of, up there. All of this stuff is just buried in there, and you can then go back to the annals and have some stuff that you've been scratching your head about, and there is the answer. So, um, and this is what it all looks like then when you go into the genealogies, you start putting a lot more names on the maps, as you can see. Um, and yeah, I mean, th this stuff without using the genealogies, you, you would not be able to populate this. Uh, and then you can go back to other stuff like hagiography and really get a holistic view. Um, so the Dal Rieta, um, this is just an explanation of their name, mainly associated with other side of the water. But rather strangely, if you, you know, I, I think this is quite an interesting phenomenon where you get the kings of Alba, so the kings of Scotland, the kingdom of, of Northern Britain, of Eastern Northern Britain, whatever we want to call it. Um, all the genealogies associated with them connect them back to the Dal Rieta, to one branch in the, of the Dal Rieta, to the Canal Nyoran, and have a figure called Fergus Moore as their Ur uh, ancestor. Um, but Fergus Moore, I would argue, might have been invented in the 10th century in Armagh for the tripartite life of Patrick as a way for Armagh to claim Scotland by going, well, you know, if they were friends, then, you know, we should, um, you know, we should be the archdiocese. The Scotland should be in the Armagh archdiocese. You know how Armagh goes, you know. So, um, but here it, like I, I've, I've 
three articles coming out about this material. It has taken me 60,000 words to try and make sense of all of this, but it's a very clumsy pasting on as well. Um, and I really don't know, like trying to find, is this propaganda or is it somebody trying to tidy up something in the scriptorium? It is very hard to disentangle that, I think. But what I will say is, um, well, I'll say that in a minute, I, um, is that there are multiple sources drawn together under this, uh, so the Ganelach Alb Albigenensium and stuff like that, um, where it might be a little bit older. So you get this Kefret Priv Canela Dalrieta, for example, where it goes and it outlines four of the main groups. That doesn't mean they're four uh, main lineages, it just means four main lineages. And that's tagged on um, to the end of this um, genealogy of the Kings of Alba. And in the um, TCD um, MS 1298, it is followed then by the genealogies of all those groups. Um, and, and this is unique stuff, but lo and behold, Fergus Moore isn't in there. Uh, there's a guy called Magnisha in there. So you're looking at something that's maybe a little bit older than this official um, version, you know. So we can maybe talk about that in the questions, but I will point you towards my Becoming Dalrieta article coming out soon in the Scottish Historical Review, where I, I really go into this um, in, in, in a lot of detail. Um, then there's another text, the Minugut Shanachas of Fair and Alban, which is probably the most discussed text in Scottish history, or med early medieval Scottish history, but it's only found in Irish manuscripts, and it's a mess. It's about four different texts. It's basically someone who's in a scriptorium has all of these bits and pieces of information and just goes, well, I just put better put them all together and have a go. There's about 10 different internal contradictions, but you can divide it into maybe four incomplete texts um, that tell four different things maybe. And uh, yeah, there's a, on, on the left-hand side, there is the Book of Ballymot, a version of uh, Minigud Shankas Fernalban, and then the, um, the four main, uh, sorry, four main groups of Dalrieta in the Book of Leinster on the right. But I, I will say this, what the most unusual thing about all this is, is that the, this group who were really, really dominant in the 7th and 8th century in Western Scotland, nobody else claims them in the high and late medieval period. So you saw Simon Egan's fantastic lecture, I hope, a few a few weeks ago, where he was talking about these uh, Gaul League families, um, as they're called from an Irish perspective, or just the local rulers um, from a Northern British perspective, but none of them connect themselves to the Dalrieta. They all connect themselves to a cadet branch of either the Canel Nogan or an Argila group. And the only text that connects the people who live in Western Scotland in the high medieval period to the Dalrieta is actually the Orkney Inga saga, where it's just thrown in there that Sovereign and his sons are of the Dalrieta. So that's you know mind blowing stuff, I suppose. And then very, very, very quickly, um, I'm not expecting anybody to read all the information on this slide. This is just to show you, you know, how much stuff is available and how you might walk through it. So first of all, you get this main thing to look at is the bold. So the bold bits are people who are branches and then they might list the branches and then the underlined and bold are people who eventually become surnames or dynasty names. So anybody who's got some Waterford family feelings, for example, we're going to see those now. And then this is the next one, I think, in terms of dating. So you see the Phelan there, so that's the E Phelan. And um, so that's Phelan. And then, so, you know, there's the equivalent then in the book of Leinster. So you can see three different texts are already telling you three different things. And these are supposed to be drawn on the same exemplar. But then in the book of Leinster, you move on to the next thing and you get a C group, a D to O group, <laughs> a set of groups, a P group. A Q to U group, the Ebridge or the Ebridge lineages, the Erosa lineages. I know I've run out of letters in the alphabet, so we're going to have to move on to Greek. So we get the Ephirgar. Um, so then we get the Ephothids, who are probably the most important group earlier, along with the Erosa. Then we get the Eangusa. Then we get a final Shanaka statement. So you can see if you're interested in your Deshi genealogies, and this is not particular to just this, that if you go and you compare between the Book of Leinster B502 and Lekin, whatever bits have been published, you can really, really, really find a lot of stuff. And I will say that the Erosa are moved around in this material. They're pushed back because they're not important anymore. This was one of the most important groups in the south of Ireland in the 8th century. All the early uh, references in the annals are to this group. Early sagas are, are about this group. Um, the thought that they're the second most important, the Yengasa, and then it's the group who become the, the Felons or Ephelon, which you'll see here in, in a little map that I put together. So there you can kind of compare the settlement pattern on the right to uh, where these dominant groups are. So you can kind of see the Ivrun, uh, hopefully you can see it down in the center of the map. Um, they 
they become uh, important because they are uh, main people in the Dal Gosh army. Um, you actually see them having military roles. And then if the Psalter of Cashel has been put together for the Dal Gosh and their allies, then all the other data groups just get pushed aside. Uh, but what does all this teach us? Um, well, what I just said, what happened to the earlier groups, I think they get pushed aside. But before we finish, um, I, I will say that you can kind of get a sense of the rewriting that's going on. So the, the foolish people of Ireland or foolish Irish people have forgotten their heritage and are uh, boasting about things that didn't happen. This is putting the words some, uh, sometimes in Cormac and Killinon, but it's used to open um, a major section in the um, genealogies that are found in Lekin, the, the group three genealogies. So I think that that's what we have to keep in mind. If this is in the Psalter of Cashel, this is our rewriting. We can remember for you wholesale, I put there from Philip K. Dick, because it's, it's creating a new memory. And uh, yeah, what are they for? I think we'll use that to structure our questions, Luke, rather than me uh, walk through all of them. But I will say it's all about the malleability of the evidence that we shouldn't expect all of this to be truth, one version of truth, that it's, it might be true for different time, different periods in time, and then it gets repurposed and becomes a usable past used in a different way over time. So we need to keep that in mind as we walk through it, and when we do it, it can be a fantastic resource. So thanks very much. Sorry, you went a couple of minutes over there. Gamil Mahagat, Russell, Tashe, Tashe Go, Intak, Olas. So thank you very much. Really interesting information. Should I go and share the screen? Um, yes, if you could, please, yeah. So I think that's sort of a tour de force, let's say, of um, the Irish genealogical tradition and particularly going right back to, to the really inception, the early inceptions of it, but also covering those interlinkages between Southwest Scotland. So you mentioned the Dol Rieda and also um, Northeast Ireland and the rest of Ireland as well. And obviously you touched on the um, growth and the uh, interest in Shenachus and, and genealogy in the Northwest part of Ireland in Connacht, that sort of area, yeah. possibly attributed to the uh, Econohor or the O'Connor kings in the sort of 13th, 14th century after, during the Gaelic revival, after the um, reform of the church yeah. and the changes we start to see with the, um, with Irish ecclesiastical interests and the growth of learned families yeah. and the poets, the fili, the, the historians, the shenachi and, and so forth. We can touch on that yeah. a little bit later in the Q&A. But what I'm interested in is just stepping back a bit. There's a lot of information there, but maybe even in simple terms, um, uh, if we could just focus on what was the ultimate source of the Irish genealogical tradition? Was it a Christian emulation? Because a lot of these are written in the scriptoria of the pre-12th century, let's call it the native uh, church. Was it a Christian emulation of biblical genealogies, which we find in the Old Testament? And we do know that the Irish clerics were really focused particularly on the Old Testament, and or perhaps like the Gospel of Matthew, which has a genealogy of Christ, were they using that as sort of a, a template or were they looking at other texts, Subius's um, uh, history of the church and the, the, the synchronisms, as you mentioned earlier, of king lists and, and, and dynasties? Did that all sort of factor into an overall sort of template and why the Irish got so interested in genealogies in the early medieval period? Um, short answer, yes. <laughs> so long answer, I think, in at least two different phases. Um, because you do, if you read between the lines of something like um, Vita Columbi Sancti, or, um, so by mm -hmm. Adolfon, mm -hmm. for example, there is this interest in Gens and Populus, Populus Corcorati, as he mm -hmm. calls the mm -hmm. Dalriata when he's talking about uh, one of the Canal um in a conversion event. Of course, these have always been used for for Christian uh, purposes, but sometimes there are just these throwaway things. So for me, that would already um, demonstrate that in Iona, um, in the late seventh century, this is already becoming um, an interest. And so I think that, yeah, in the first phase, you do have this very Christian, very um, Old Testament oriented um, gathering of Shanachus. And you have to remember that our first exemplar for the, for what became the sets of Irish Annals is from this period as well, around 670, it seems that they're being recorded contemporarily and maybe reworking notes that were put into Easter tables and, and, and so on and so forth. And but again, just stay with the Iona example, the connection to the Canal Connell is always emphasized um, with all of the Iona output. 
uh, Colin Killer and Adovan on board mm -hmm. related to the Canal Connell. And I think we've got mm -hmm. some really, really unique uh, Canal Connell genealogical material that's uh, just embedded in V502 and LL, but it's kind of a throwaway thing where you get all the names of Colin Killer's uncles and all this kind of thing that, you know, it's, so it does seem to be already a consideration at that point in time. But then, yeah, you mentioned the synchronisms and everything. I think then in the 10th century, there's a new um, revised interest that's kind of drawn a lot on 9th century interaction with the uh, Frankish intellectual scene and everything where there's this um, push to have a more totalized uh, version of the past. So I think it was probably a bit more amorphous up until then, or at least there was a maybe a Iona Bangor Armagh tradition and then some other things going on that don't necessarily survive so clearly. Uh, and I think that's related to as well, what the standard of all Irish is so, it doesn't change much between those things. So um, it might be that there was a, already an official version coming between, um, a mutually beneficial uh, between Bangor, Iona and Armagh, but we have some other stuff going on. But I think a lot of that other material only makes it into the Middle Irish collections mm. where they're trying to have this totalized view and um, to put everything in terms of invasions and arrivals, just like the, just like the Franks did. You know, mm. this is, a, a, I think, a very, very influential thing. And I think it's also the same thing that we find in, for example, East Lindinger book and uh, Landama book and, and, and maybe even in um, Historia Norvegia. Um, they're, they're, uh, and in the so-called Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, there just seems to be this Europe-wide interest um, in this period. So that was a very long answer to follow my very short answer of yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed, that's really useful. Maybe just to drill down and be a bit more nuanced on that point. So are we seeing from the 9th and 10th century in the Middle Irish period, um, particular places of scholarship? These are large scriptoria, which are then doing that sort of meta narrative, as you're saying, this sort of total or universal history. Can we attribute it to several centers of learning and I suppose at a sub point, can we attribute it to certain individuals such as Flan Monastrach yeah. of, of Monaster Boyce? And of course, Monaster Boyce was part of this sort of Armagh um, um, sphere of influence. Would that be uh, perhaps a, a, a correct way of looking at this? Oh, I, I definitely think so. I but I think there are competing ones as well. Um, I think even if you follow um, the proposed exemplar of the, the shared behind all of the surviving sets of annals before it departs, in the 10th century, even then it's already demonstrating that there are centres where annals are being recorded that we would never expect there to be a scriptorium otherwise. But I, so I think there are several competing projects at work, but Armagh is definitely the biggest and most successful. But there's one in Clam Noise, definitely from the 10th and 11th century onwards as well. There's one somewhere in Munster, uh, probably somewhere like Emily, I would imagine. I mean, one thing you can do is use the annals and track everyone who's mentioned uh, this more that's a very good point as well uh, this more art more kind of entangled is, is go through the annals and when you find um, an orbit of somebody and they might be described as something like C or um, as, as a scholar as sapientissima or uh, all of these things and yeah I would say that I think you can see this already in the 9th century in Armagh with the, with the so-called book of Armagh but that's a study book, but that just shows what the abbots of Armagh were expected to know, that they're expected to have a study book that has writings on Patrick, that has the life of Germanus, that has the, um, you know, the supposedly obsolete uh, version of the Old Testament, that that's what the abbots were sitting there reading. But I think with someone like Yosef, who I would propose as the original um, sponsor compiler of the tripartite life in the 10th century, I think it's in his period then that Armagh really ups the ante um, in terms of uh, this official uh, account of, of Irish history that you find in, in, in Flan Man uh, Manistrach and everything then as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. But I think it's for, also for training purposes that it's not just about propaganda, it's about a scholars tidying up things just like we try and do as scholars, we're just part of the same tradition ourselves, but b teaching, you know, that these things you have to know all of these things before you are let record the animals, you're supposed to know all of the Mm. everything behind it. That's why the annals are so terse, because there's so much received wisdom in every entry that has all of us banging our heads off the table, where we have to sometimes do five years research to figure out one item, you know. So, um, yeah, again, I think, yeah, def de definitely four or five uh, major uh, centres. 
but our mask was major. Indeed. So maybe if we just talk about those four or five centres just briefly. So we talk about the scriptoria. Um, so what does a scriptorium at this period look like? Um, we have these powerhouses of, of centres of scholarship, Armagh, Clon McNoyes, uh, Lismore and, and elsewhere, Bangor perhaps. But what did it actually, how did it manifest itself? Are we talking about um, uh, many clerics who are engaged in this activity? Is it just the upper echelon of those clerics? We see from maybe about the 9th or 10th century the Irish annals, they start to use a native term, the Farlian or the man of learning, yeah. the lector perhaps we would, we would translate that as. Um, is it these people who are specialising in scholarship and indeed in the latter period are they becoming more secular? Are they pure clerics or are they perhaps clerics in minor orders instead? Um, I would say probably in full orders. Um, I think that you're expected to know this stuff to be at the absolute top. I think one of the ways that we can uh, maybe have a look at what it would have looked like in terms of um, the people involved is run the numbers, look at all the people who um, are described as that in their orbits and then see how many of them would have been alive at the same time. And I think it's something like the German academic system today where that's the professor's name is the one that's remembered, um, mm -hmm. but the professor uh, in their layer stool might have two to four um, privat dots and uh, people who even done their habilitations, or which is like a second PhD. Yeah. Then they will have people who are at postdoctoral level after their first, after the PhD, and then they will have people who are doing their PhDs, and then a whole host of undergrads. And all these people are grinding stuff out, I think, at the behest of the of the person charged, and I think you do find that when you look in the book of our man, you have Ferdovnach um, putting together the text at the behest of Torvach, and then Torvach died, and then uh, Ferdovnach seems to have put all of Torvach's notes in as well, and just bound it all together as a tribute. And I think when our man lost so many other manuscripts, this uh, then is a kind of important manuscript, whereas before it was probably you know, just the Abbott's personal personal book, you know, but it does give us an insight, I think, into the professor, the all of the, yeah, the Abbott telling somebody, you know, one of the Privat on Sentin or the professor's assistant, put this book together for me. And, um, you know, and I think that this is probably what's going on um, a lot yeah. of the time, because some, some of this stuff, I, I know that uh, um, that Dovel Talk my favorite, she managed to put together his book in two years, but some of this stuff I think would take a team of people working um, around the clock for 10 years, you know. Mm -hmm. So a substantial effort. Um, and I suppose that speaks to the influence, the status, and of course the wealth of some of these monasteries yeah. to be able to do that, um, simply just to get the, the calf skins for the yeah. manuscripts. Um, okay, so what we've sort of spoken about so far is I suppose, um, uh, genealogies, shanachus, that sort of wider history being compiled in, in an ecclesiastical milieu. Mm. But we see quite a difference after the 12th century, and particularly from the so-called Gaelic revival of sort of the, the, the early 14th century, maybe we could trace it even to the late 13th century, that a lot of these genealogical compilations um, going forward from that point are actually no longer done by clerics per se, but are actually done by um, learned but secular individuals. Um, one argument is that these individuals trace their origins, their family origins, back to the monastic scriptoria. So their ancestors were were, were scholars within the church schools and, and so forth. Um, and some of the earliest texts which you alluded to start to appear in this more secular milieu in Northwest Ireland in Connacht. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that and perhaps the implications that might have for our study of genealogy from our point of view today. Yeah, gladly, actually, it's a subject close to my heart. I think um, as well, it's worth bearing in mind that um, Rawlinson B512, which is our principal recension for the tripartite life of Patrick, and one of our main recensions for the commentaries on the Irish martyrologies, which is a, all of the, it's, it's an amazing, um, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever uh, dealt with this stuff, but mm -hmm. it's basically where they get all the names mentioned in the martyrologies and put all the information together for each one of those names. And this seems to be done in Armagh in about uh, between 1070 and 1170. But our, our, well, some of our main um, manuscripts are from schools, um, either secular or ecclesiastic um, in North Connacht as well. Um, and of course, you get um, Rawlinson B488, the Annals of Tigernach, as they often get called uh, because somebody just put the gloss on 1088 into the main text and then someone said, oh, well, Tigernach must have written this up until now and somehow kept on writing it for another 120 years <laughs> in exactly the same language with the same mistakes in the Latin. 
but there is this North Connacht attempt, I think, uh, a very successful attempt at all Canicus, we might call it, where they're just trying to get everything that's there. Um, I, so I suppose some of these manuscripts were in bad shape, sort of a lot of time maybe just copying this stuff as well. That, that's also quite an important consideration. And But the Annals of Tigranach, when you actually go and look at them, or the B488 Annals, as we should be calling them, tend to leave out a lot of material about the abbots of Clonmac Noise, even though it's based on a set of Clonmac Noise Annals, and play up the Eve rune. Uh, so mm. you get stuff in there that's not in Chronicon Scotorum, that's not in the uh, the English uh, 17th century translation of the Annals of Clonmac Noise. So there is mm. a secular interest maybe coming to the fore even there, and I would argue that maybe that's one of our sets of Annals that was composed not in an ecclesiastic context. And the reason I bring up that so much is I think that that then helps explain what's going on with the Book of Lekin, the Book of Ballymote, um, the Book of Imania, that again, it's it's this um, yeah, shift to a more secular, slightly more secular view, at least. I mean, these people were still Christians, uh, you know, but yeah, you, you get this shift that way, but it's also, I think, as well, the fear of stuff going missing. I know that that's what Keating used as his, um, his excuse to write to well, make up a lot of stuff about Irish history in, in some instances, that it was supposed to be about preserving a lot of material before it was lost, which, I, you know, he, he didn't really, he did something else, which is fascinating in its own right, mm -hmm. but, but I think that that is a major concern. And But if you can preserve what's been preserved, but also big up the patron, mm. I think the two it was, it's probably about 60, 40, 70, mm -hmm. 30. So, uh, and I mean, if you compare, the Book of Ballymote with, with uh, Lekin, you know, you can see who the patrons were because they get more genealogies in there and more mm. branches of the families mm. are mentioned. But other than that, yeah, it's it's about preservation. As, uh, and if you can preserve stuff while preserving the reputation of your patron, then so much the better. But surely that's the important point, isn't it? Um, who the patrons were. Mm. So in that context, we think we're, we're, possibly it's the O'Connor, the O'Connor kings of, of Connacht mm. might potentially have been the sponsors. Um, one could envisage a situation where you have the Gaelic revival of the late 13th, 14th century, and so you have these learned families perhaps being attached to the um, to the royal court of the O'Connors um, at this at this stage. Or indeed, if we look into the 14th century, we have a particularly and particularly interesting Shanachie, um Sean O'Duagan, who is writing um, essentially for the O'Kellys of uh, Iwana as well. So it seems like it, it, part of this has been driven from a secular perspective to legitimize the rule um, um, and the lordship of the O'Connors or the O'Kellys and, and other ones. I wonder if you could speak to that maybe a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, you know, you're definitely hitting the nail on the head there. I mean, like the TCD 2.7 uh, is sometimes called uh, 1298. Now, that's also from Ivania. That's the other book of Ivania. So you get two out of the five main collections are coming from East County Galway, which cannot be a mistake there. But but I mean, if I was maybe um, act as devil's advocate there to, to this, then how, how do we explain the Macfirvishik um, over the course of several hundred years? Because they claim descent from the uh, the Fiachach and not mm. from the Evrin, like the Uaconcovar or the Macdonica, because it's the Macdonica rather than the Uaconcovar are the sponsors of uh, mm. the production of the Book of Ballymote. But, you know, what's good for the Macdonica what's, is good for the, um, the Uaconcovar, I suppose they're, you know, the same group almost. But, um, yeah, so then is it the McFeary Sheik then are going, oh, but here's the, you know, we've got the alternative facts. I, I, I don't think. I think that's pushing it too far, but there's definitely maybe a little bit of competition between some of these groups as well to have their book. Yeah, if I could respond to that. So I think what we do start to see, at least in the late medieval period, is a remaking of some of these learned families. Mm -hmm. So if we go a little bit further south, the North Connacht to the um, Kingdom of Tomond, we see the likes of um, the McCraw, the McGrath family who were let's say, um, Philly or poets to the O'Briens. I think the, the earliest reference to them is circa 1098. Um, and they're, they're, they're recorded as, as, as the Philly of, of Munster. So the, the, the poets to the, to the O'Brien overlord kings. But then later uh, in the medieval period, you have the rise of the McBrody or McBroder, the Clan Vroder family, who themselves possibly tr are traced to the Corkham Row and not the Dalgash. But the McGraths are of the Dalgash, so of the same 
um, broad kin group as the O'Briens. Um, but yet we find the Macbroder becoming the olive to O'Brien, at least in history, and themselves eclipsing another lineage, the the the, the Curtains or the, the Clan Cretin. So it seems as though we, in some circumstances, we find these learned families who may have been, their ancestors may have been pushed down the social um, strata, um, reassert themselves as learned families, take themselves out of the political competition for, for power, and actually become learned families in their own right, sort of carving out um, a status, a space for themselves. So perhaps that's what's also happening at this at oh, this stage. I, I think that again, that's, that's that's quite accurate, and I think it's not just something peculiar to the late medieval period either. Because if you look at someone like the the Lahana, um, mm -hmm. which give the name to Loch Larne and Larne Town and everything, and um, they have several kings mentioned in in the annals. And I think what happened there as well is the reason that those kings are mentioned in the annals is not because they were particularly important. It's that they got shunted into mm -hmm. um, a sideline, which definitely happened, we'd say, with Connor. Um, I, I gave a paper last year about um, the, a grandiose amount of Connor as opposed to the angry grandiose amount of Armagh, but they're very much, the Dal Sonia um, group are shunted aside by the Equadalbots who became, rebrand themselves as Dal Narja, and they pushed those in, or at least offered them the out, and you know they run Connor then for the next few hundred years, and then, yeah, they're a cadet branch, so it can be, a little bit of a pressure valve at times, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes then you get the opposite happening. I think where you do get a group that's not related to the main line reshape genealogy to go, oh, but if you look, there was actually a second wife and another couple of sons, and here we are, you know, um, which happens a lot, which is actually how the doll got to attach themselves to the organots and claim <laughs> to be all kings of Munster anyway. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's. It's a mystery wrapped up in an enigma. <laughs> no, indeed. Um, so we've spoken at quite some detail in terms of the origins of the genealogies, the centers of learning. But I suppose, what were the actual functions of genealogies? I mean, could uh, one, one, one idea or one view is that they were used as almost title inheritance documents, claims on church positions or claims on ruling um, sovereignty, essentially, over territorial um, uh, entities. but. Is there any other comparable tradition in Europe which also uses genealogies for the same reason? It seems like the Irish almost fixated on genealogies. Uh, well, there's, there's nothing, I, I'm not an Irish exceptionalist normally, but there is nothing quite like the collection that survives. Um, no, whether that's to do with- um, Annoying as hell. Stop it. Stop it. If, uh, whether that's to do with um, the randomness of survival uh, or not, it's, it's hard to tell, but, um, if you look at maybe um, to Scotland or the Kingdom of Alba, occasionally you do get the claims of kings. Um, you get the genealogy read out as part of the ceremony ahead of a uh, king. Um, and I think that, that um, I think I found an example as well um, with, uh, with ninth century Frankish kingdoms, or sometimes the the right to rule is, is um, read out. And I think that that's one of the things that's behind, for example, in, mm. in Irish, the Banyanicus, mm. which is the, the lore or the heritage of important women not just women, but important women. And there you find again and again and again that important kings have an important father, but they also have an important mother who's from also from an important family. So, and sometimes then maybe the female line was read out and I, I've maybe found that as well in some of the stuff to do with Orkney and some of the Icelandic and Norwegian sources. So I think it's, it's something that does happen again and again. Um, there might be something in uh, to do with Chinese emperors and um, Abbasid caliphs as well that I've come across. Um, I, I used to work in Beijing, so I had discussions with Chinese historians about about this. So it, it does seem to be something a bit more universal than we might realise. But at the same time, we do have to acknowledge that there's nothing quite like the Irish collection in terms of content and extent. Yes, indeed. And so you've mentioned some other sources there, and I was wondering what is the interaction between the Irish or Gaelic genealogies, not just Irish, but Scottish genealogies, of course, and other native sources which we have. So we have things like the Dean Hanichus, the law on, on important places, um, or perhaps that meta-narrative of medieval Ireland, um, on Law Gawala Erin, the, the book of the taking of Ireland. So what is perhaps, um, just briefly, the interaction between the genealogies and those other type of texts? A brief answer for that. Um, it's taken me 60,000 words to do exactly this just for the material on the Dalriata, and, and I'm still not there yet. Um, 
Yeah, so you definitely, I, I, I'll give you one example. So I gave a paper a couple of years ago about uh, Fergus Mormach Erk, who is the um, progenitor ancestor figure of all of the kings of Alba via the Canaan branch of the Dal Riata. But Fergus appears nowhere in text until the 10th century. You know, he's put into the Annals of Tigernach and the Annals of Clonmac Noyes as having died in 500. But I've hopefully demonstrated in this paper I've got coming out how it's the um, the scriptorium in Clan McNoise is using the latest in historical scholarship, the tripartite life of Patrick, where Fergus makes his first appearance and goes, well, we better put him into this new set of annals when we're revising the exemplar. So there's a rewriting where they put all the information from all the other categories of evidence into their set of annals. And I think sometimes then these revised sets of annals are used in turn to produce the new redactions. So, for example, what I call the Northern Redaction 1 and Northern Redaction 2 produced in Armagh. That some of this material then, oh, it's in the annals, so we better figure out where to put this into the genealogy. So there's a definitely um, interaction going on over the course of decades in between scriptoria and within the scriptorium, where the, what's regarded as the latest in historical scholarship is used to update all the different types of texts, basically the same as we would do now if we were doing an edition, mm -hmm. we would put in all these footnotes. Yes, yes. No, indeed. Um, so the Irish genealogical tradition, I think it's, it's correct to say, lasts over perhaps even 1500 years if you in, if you if you also incorporate um, genealogy still being copied and recopied into the late 19th century indeed even on manuscripts yeah. um, and into the 20th century scholars um, um, burying you know deep into the manuscripts themselves and studying them but uh, I suppose if we have to put sort of a, a date on when the key function of the genealogies came to an end and sort of withered away. Um, uh, when would that be and how did that sort of look like? Uh, nice, easy question to finish with, is it? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say that these genealogies are still valid. We're still using them right now. We're a, as scholars. We're part of this tradition ourselves. If I was, if or when I produce the, the stuff on, on the data or the Dalriata in, in even more detail and I'll have annotated genealogies comparing between all the manuscripts. What am I doing that's any different from Flan Manusloch, really? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's worth keeping in mind on one level. But then on the other level, yeah, I I would say definitely when there's a lot of land confiscations, um, they maybe become less relevant. But even then, when you there is another way of even reading those land confiscations that are still making reference to this material. So even if you look at the um, what's it in um, the plantation of Ulster under James the First, which um, all of the confiscations are preserved. Um, at least the manuscripts not preserved anymore. We've lost it, but there is at least an addition of it. Um, and even there, you know, some of it still. Re if you didn't know about how all these genealogies, you can still see some of that stuff imprinted there. And I tried to do a case study of it about the Cothriga uh, up in northeast Antrim, about from Cothriga to Kerry. So the barony of Kerry is still used as a, a concept in the plantations. And I've tried to show that the genealogical tradition is still even important after people have been dispossessed and removed from the land, that there's still a relevance in there. So that makes it then very difficult to, to point to any kind of zero point at which they're not so relevant anymore. But Actually, I think even in regard to the um, confiscations of the plantation of Ulster, if I remember correctly, those inquisitions from sort of 1609 onwards, there's a reference, I think, to, um, is it Sir John Davis um, or the other English officials who are consulting with the likes of O'Breslan, mm -hmm. the, the Brehan, for information about land holding and yeah. so forth. So these hereditary custodians of tradition, whether it's the Brehans, the, um, the historians or the poets, are still being almost co-opted yeah. uh, in terms of land ownership. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, if you look at the, um, the first Earl of Antrim, so Randall MacDonald mm -hmm. or uh, Randall MacDonald, if you want to give him mm -hmm. his uh, other name, um, you know, he, he has a kind of different approach to the plantations, of course. Mm. Um, sometimes he's not really seen as much of a planter. He is very much so. But again, he's still drawn on that late, you know, high and late medieval tradition in there. I mean, he's the one who told um, Usher about the extent mm. of the kingdom of Dal Riata mm. that you see repeated again and again. It only appears in Usher's pseudo life of Patrick. Um, and his main source is Randall MacDonald for all of his stuff about place names where people are located in the landscape and everything. So 
Yeah, that to me makes it very hard to identify a zero point, but there's definitely an obsolescence, we might call it, in the 18th and 19th centuries that then kind of become, but even then there's the revival from the Ardent Survey onwards. So there's a kind of brief hundred year period maybe mm. where they're not quite obsolete, but they're not quite important, but mm. then they become important for a different reason mm. and different way after that. And, and we even have the likes of Roderick or Rory O'Flaherty um, from to the west of, of Galway, who in the 1680s writes his um, um, his history or his observations on on uh, West Connacht, and he's also drawing on genealogical and more generally historical sources. And then you have the manuscript, the so-called manuscript men of the 19th century. Yeah. These are copyists trying to preserve that yeah. that tradition. In the 18th century, with the likes of O'Connor, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and, and there's all these other associates of O'Connor. But I mean, I've maybe found evidence that even people like Lawrence Noel, who's the right-hand man slash spy slash cartographer slash um, collector of English manuscripts is also doing this in Ireland when he's over as a spy on, on behalf of Cecil. Mm. Um, that's our first, one of our first really accurate maps of Ireland is done mm. by him and in Scotland and then he maybe spies a little bit too hard and disappears over in Germany. But um, but again, you know, that there's even this acknowledgement in the Elizabethan court under Cecil who was her, he's the brains behind everything that's going on in the Elizabethan period, that his manuscript men are also interested in the Irish traditions a bit more than we might mm. previously have acknowledged. And what of the Scottish traditions? Are we seeing the same sort of end point in the 18th century? We know that there are certain Scottish um, hereditary families like the McVorrocks and others who produce the um, Red Book of Clan, Clan Reynolds and, and other ones, I think that's sort of 1720s. Do we see sort of a similar tradition um, also into the 18th century and into the 19th century uh, in, in Scottish Gaeldom or is it different? I, I think it's a little bit different. Um, like the book of Clan Reynolds and, and books like that are often a pushback against encroachment by grants of land to other families and you know what I mean. It was touched on a little bit by, by Simon and in the Q&A after, after, after Simon's talk the last time is, is about you know the the shadow of, of the Campbells, you know, and yeah. that sometimes then the Campbells go, oh, look, um, you know, our second cousin, 15 times removed, um, he was, you know, granted blah, blah, blah. And, the, you know, sometimes we love text to prove it, but often they don't. So I think sometimes some of these books are being put together to just go, you know, past this line, you shall not push. But then, you know, how much contact is there between, like, so Randall, come back to Randall again, he's from, you know, a cadet branch of the of the mm -hmm. McDonald or McDonald's, whichever you want to call them, McGonnell, I usually call them, but um, it's not like they weren't in contact either. And if yeah. something's working yeah. for one, they're, you know, working for the other. So, but again, you know, the 18th century in Scotland, there is kind of a shift in intellectual life a lot. Um, and, but then like so-called lowland groups do become interested from the 18th century onwards in all of this stuff as well. You get, you know, Buchanan and you get all these, uh, yeah. you know, so, uh, um, uh, Boike, Boy said, I never know how to pronounce his name. Yeah. Um, you know, you do get all of these from even in the 17th century onwards. So it's, um, but in, in some instances, I think in, in that they're copying, uh, or at least copying, they're emulating the competition in England between Parker and Cecil. And I think that that's something that we leave out even about the Irish stuff is that this was such a famous um, competition between them. To, he, who could gather the most manuscripts from all the dispossessed uh, monasteries? And OK, it was done to preserve knowledge, but it was also done to go, I have the most knowledge, you know, because scholars are nothing if they're not competitive a lot of the time, um, even though collaboration is the way to go. But um, so I think like, that is a very famous example. And we don't really think about that enough in Ireland and Scotland. But I think that there is a kind of emulation of that from even from the 16th century onwards about this preserving knowledge um, for knowledge's sake as mm. much as anything. So maybe it does shift more to preserving knowledge for knowledge's sake, mm. but at the same time, knowledge is never value neutral. So mm. Mm. I think just before we wrap up, I think we just one more question and perhaps to, for our audience. If people are using genealogies, dipping into some of these Rawlingson and other ones that we had um, talked to today, what would be the sort of um, pointers for a for a beginner? In terms of using these now i it's quite possible many of our members won't have either latin or sufficient irish in which to perhaps engage with them um so if there's any kind of general pointers you could give to some of those researchers please yeah um well one pointer i would give any is the um the, Le the lekin stuff shanika shield here uh published by um, margaret dobbs it's not the most perfect edition 
but she does provide a translation and the translation is usually accurate. There, there are issues, of course, there's issues with everything. I mean, if I was to do something in the morning, there'd be 10 issues next week, but um, her translation and her very clear layout does give you a key where you can at least work from what she has translated and find where it is in, um, in O'Brien's edition of Rawlinson. So the, the, the 1962 one that um, is in the, the, the reading list where he um, publishes the Rawlinson genealogies and then uses cross references to divergences in the book of Leinster, Lekin and um, Ballymote. And then he publishes at the end of that book all the stuff that's in the book of Leinster that wasn't in B502. But that is hard stuff to work with. I mean, even if you do have old and middle Irish and Latin, you know, there's abbreviations, there's just, you know, there's just, it can be a bit difficult. Um, but the, yeah, Dobbs' translation, and, and of course, then there's the Machvirvishig, um, where um, Nolig Moralia provides a translation for everything. And then you've got all the names in the nominative, um, so the subject, so Russell rather than Russell's, which in English isn't so bad, but you know, when you start talking about Sean and then Machioin, then, you know, and then mediate that through 20 scholars, it can, um, you know, get, get a bit tricky. So again, you can use his translation, but with the caveat that McFerby should rewrote a lot of stuff, let's face it. Mm. There's a lot of stuff that's copied directly from the Book of Imania, for example, but there's a lot of stuff that McFerby should so his recension of Munich uh, Shanika's Fern Alban is a complete rewrite. Mm. So yeah, if you start using some of those and then I'd say you can get through once you learn a little bit of what these things are and some of the keywords in Old Irish and Middle Irish, you can get through about 70% of the it's material. It's quite formulaic yeah. some of it, yeah. You yeah. can learn the formula. There is a hack, shall we say. It's only when you come across the the, the statements, the, the, the mini good Shankus statements, then they're, they get quite difficult because sometimes they're corrupted, but also they might have originated as 8th century Old Irish texts. Um, but you know, seventy percent isn't bad, you know, and I think that people shouldn't be so afraid of using it. Um, just always acknowledge that, you know, you don't have the full expertise, and if you publish anything in a local journal or anything like that, just say this is my reading of it. I, you know, never claim to be the final word, and I would say that to the most senior of professors should never claim to be the final word on anything because the final word on something will come with the apocalypse. You know, it's. There, there will always be another word. So um, yeah, so don't be afraid of using them. And if anyone ever has any questions, um, I'm always happy to uh, exchange emails with people because sometimes I get great ideas myself from explaining mm -hmm. something to someone. I might go, oh, hang on, you know, have an idea, you know, have a thought myself that I hadn't had yet. Um, so perhaps like a 12th century scholar, that collaboration is really important for both sides. Is, well, all these glasses have to come out of somewhere, you know, where <laughs> so you write out something and you go, ah, but hang on. And then, you know, because a lot of sometimes you find the glasses are in the exact same hand that wrote the manuscript. It's not mm. necessarily someone who's revising, it's to someone who wrote something and went, well, I'm not tearing it up, so I'm just going to, you know, mm -hmm. add to it. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's an iterative pro process and it's a collaborative process. We should all be collaborating on this and not competing. Mila mm -hmm. Buikas. Thank you very much for that, Russell. Really, really, interest, really interesting and really detailed. I'm sure there's a lot there for our members um, to get their teeth into, so to speak. So um, from talking about, I suppose, the more